Hi everybody, merci Hervé pour, pour l'introduction. Euh, je suis vraiment très heureuse pour l'invitation. Merci de, de m'avoir invité à joindre Bosque à Montréal, tout en français. <laughs> merci. Um, so today I'm, you know, really, really honored and really excited to be here with uh, this group of people and tell you about uh, some of the works I've been doing, some of the works that I want to keep on doing, and some ideas I have for future work that. I'd like to be doing with all of you. Um, and so I will, I will give you a little bit of a, you know, let's go on a journey together over some of uh, the projects I worked on, what I've learned through, uh, some of the, I think, global challenges we all need to face today, some of the solutions that we, we have developed, we know exist, and then move on to what's next and what can we do uh, better. And so, you know, thinking back about where it all started, it all started a long time ago. I was going back in time. It started 20 years ago, and I just fell in love with data. And I really fell in love with data, figuring out, you know, there's a diversity, a range of data. It comes in plenty of shapes, plenty of data types. We can talk about health, we can talk about information, computer science. There's a wide range of data that's out there. We just need to be able to touch it and leverage it and extract all that information and knowledge. And very specifically, the, the context in which it will happen for me, um, I grew up in the northeast of France, first French speaking, in uh, Strasbourg. Strasbourg is a very nice uh, little town in the northeast by the German border. And uh, it has a very picturesque little river in the middle of the city. And uh, the Pont Couvert is where I was walking by every morning going to a university. So it was very, very nice. And I was doing my master's degree in uh, computer science in uh, Strasbourg. And in France, when you do a master's degree, you do half theory and half internship. And my internship at the time was in a, in a public laboratory, a wet lab. And they were looking into uh, elucidating a membrane protein structure. So looking at expressing G protein coupled receptors expressing them across different systems, and then trying to see, you know, can we derive better protocol and information? Can we generate little crystal where we can throw uh, X-rays at to determine structure, uh, atomic structure of the receptors? And uh, my job in that, this project, which was a partnership between a French wet lab and pharmaceutical companies, was building the reference database for the project. So it was about collecting and extracting reference information about those receptors that existed in Swiss prot and uh, publication and literature, and uh, adding in the results from the project and make that available to the pharma partners. And at the time, so that we're talking 2002, there was no uh, API for uh, Swiss prot. Uh, there was no way to actually do a query and retrieve the information and say, give me all of the publications that are linked to target ID X. So what I had to do, I had to take that long list of target ID. I had to uh, write a little scraper, go and download each of the flat file, parse each of the flat file, extract the publication ID, use the publication ID to go and query PubMed, retrieve the information, and try to parse the publication to find the protocols and the information of interest to the pharma partners. And as you, as you all know, and you can think about it, it was a pain. <laughs> it was really, really hard. There were mistakes in the files, the links were dead. Uh, there were typos, stuff that was not at the right place. Sometimes the internet was done. It was a mess. Uh, the, the other positive things that came out of this, in addition to you know loving data and structured data in particular, is the this was my first uh, time using uh, open source software. Uh, I was using at the time the the, the LAMP architecture, so that's uh, Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And as a you know as a first uh, time job, that was. That was amazing. I just downloaded the packages, installed the packages, run everything I needed, and it just, out of the box, worked for me. Didn't have to do anything more. I could really spend the time on scraping flat files. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and even when some of stuff did not quite work right, that's okay. There was a huge community of people online. I could ask my question. They were super motivated, really happy to help, and helping make things better for me, but also for everybody else. So really, it was great, flat files, yay. Um, this was really the beginning of data and what can we do better with data and how can we look at data and leverage it and take it to the next step. So I moved on from, from France 
uh, moved to the EMB LEBI in, uh, in Cambridge in the UK. And this is where I learned about ontologies and I developed the systems biology ontology, which is still in use today and which standardize um, mathematical representation for biological models. So things like uh, biochemical reactions, michaelis mantan equations and things like that. Um, and after the, after the EBI in the UK, I spent a little bit of time in, uh, in Greece where I was doing consulting. It's really nice to be in a warm country and do consulting, I recommend. And I uh, discovered the Opo Foundry, a very nice other community, open source community of ontology developers that were really, at that point in time, looking at, you know, how do we work together to establish best practices and processes in representing knowledge? How do we bring all of those people? Some people are looking into cell representation. Some people who are interested in mouse anatomy, brain cells. How do we take all of those interests? Everybody will keep working on their own, but how do we bring that together and have interoperability and shared standards and processes across so that we don't replicate the work and we can leverage uh, each other's uh, brains? Um, after, the, after Greece, I moved to, uh, to Vancouver, uh, Canada. And uh, like Hervé was saying, I ended up doing my PhD at, uh, at UBC, so I was a late PhD student, which was also really nice. Um, and I was working with uh, Mark Wilkinson on the on the CBRAS project as a, as a PhD student. Money was always tight, and uh, I was Mark's project manager. So I discovered, you know, semantic webs and uh, the his SADI platform that was about uh, interconnecting and uh, linking data. The, um, the next project I was involved with was uh, again on public health. So for epidemiology, uh, genomic epidemiology, can we do better at tracking foodborne pathogens? So this was, was with uh, Fiona Brinkman, Will Sio, uh, at SFU in, in Vancouver still. And after that, uh, I went back to uh, EBI where I had the opportunity to lead the, the gene ontology, uh, both the development of the resource and my first attempt at curation uh, so leading the gene ontology annotation team, I really thought curation was much easier than it ended up being. It was really, really hard. Uh, really interesting, again, another learning experience. Um, I, did, I, I did more work on standards, fair data, can we build interoperable resources for biosamples, uh, Seneca, which was a cross a cohort project between uh, Europe, Africa, and uh, Canada. Um, I got involved in the Global Alliance for Genomic and Health, GA4GH, uh, the Fair Plus project, and I think Robert will give a little talk later. Uh, we worked together again, another project with pharma partners, it went full circle. Uh, and last, the IHCC, the International uh, Cohort Consortium. And that led me to my current position in, uh, in Toronto. So this is not very far away from home for me, you know, Montreal is great. Um, and in Toronto, uh, we work on the on the Overture software suite, and I will tell you a little bit about what we're doing, and you, you'll have a couple of talks later about some of the projects in the team. And, you know, so, so that's my life in 20 years, over 20 years, how I was really lucky to have, you know, different location, different project, but always that story around, can we do better with data? Can we really improve data? Can we come together, leverage those huge amount of information and uh, extract new insights and knowledge. And 20 years later, uh, 2022, I'm in Toronto and a breakthrough ChatGPT comes out. I'm like, oh my God, ChatGPT is going to save the world. And those are a couple of headlines at the time where it's like, you know, uh, ChatGPT promises to transform medicine. We're all going to have access to personalized medicine. Um, some more ethical term now, should ChatGPT be an offer on research papers, uh, more balanced view, you know, there's the hype, there's the reality. Um, ChatGPT was supposed to be a Google killer. As far as I know, a Google search is still here. Um, you know, is it going to take our job away? It was like, there was a big controversy, like AI is going to displace job and people, and we're all going to suffer as a consequence. And I think my favorite is the, the, the last one, which is the attack of the psycho chatbot. Or are we under attack? And is it like a Terminator type of scenario? Um, and, you know, we, we're a couple of years later, no, 2024. And where are we at with AI? And the, the promise that AI had where I said, you know, I will take the data, I will put it into shape. You will be able to reuse it. You will do personalized medicine. You will impact health. Are we there yet? And, you know, perhaps 
unsurprisingly, I don't think we're quite there yet. Uh, so this paper published by uh, Bianchi et al. in 2023 shows some of the issues with those large uh, AI um, models. Uh, so what they've done, they've used a series of prompts to query uh, image generators. They've generated 100 images for each of the prompts. And out of the, the pool of 100 images they generated, they've extracted 10 random ones, which they've presented in that figure. So that figure shows, you know, if you query for an attractive person, you will get a collection of thin, light-skinned individual. If you're looking at emotional person, it's going to be crying women. Women are emotional and crying all the time, apparently. Um, you know, poor people and thugs are people that have dark skins. They are males and they have dark skins. Um, terrorists are Middle Eastern bearded uh, individuals. And, you know, if you want to have a happy family, it better be an heteronormative nuclear family. Uh, so, you know, is this really the world we live in or the world we want to live in? Uh, I'm going to say probably not. And at least that's not the world I want to use for uh, the, the future view of um, humanity. And you'd say, you know, there's, a, there's an easy solution. We know we don't do well at diversity. Why don't we do better? Um, and Google Gemini in 2024 came with uh, another image generator and they said, we're going to do better. We're going to enforce diversity in the model. And you, you may know that when you queried, at the time you queried Google Gemini for a 1943 German soldier, you would get an Asian, an Asian uh, Nazi soldier, which, you know, didn't quite work well either. And even worse than that, those images, those papers, those publications, they go back into the, the general knowledge. So we're entering that self-fulfilling circle where we're generating information that's inaccurate, that's gonna feed new models that are gonna generate inaccurate information. We really need to do better uh, with the data. And the, the way Bloomberg summarized uh, this, I really like this quote, which is, you know, the world according to stable diffusion is run by white male CEOs. Women don't tend to be doctors or lawyers or judges. If you're a man, you have a dark skin, you're going to commit a crime. If you're a woman with a dark skin, you're probably going to flip burgers. And you know, I, I don't want to live in that world, so I'm hoping we can do better. And talking about diversity and looking about the world we actually live in, uh, 2022, we also passed 8 billion people, so big, big landmark for humanity as a whole. And we know that this number is growing and growing. 2037, forecasted 9 million and over uh, 10 billion by 2050s. And when you look at what the human population looks like, you can see that there's uh, over a third is actually based in Asia. It's on just under 3 billion people in India and China only. The fastest growing population here is not the European population or the North American population, it's Africa. In Niger, a fertility rate is 6.5. So the world is changing, and I'm not sure our data and model is changing alongside uh, the world. And you know, you may say, okay, great, it's a problem, but is it really a problem? What's the impact of that? Um, this is just an example from the, the GWAS diversity monitor, which shows that um, you know, when you look at the, the, the population that's enrolled in GWAS study, uh, over 80% of the population is of European ancestry. That means that all the associations that are found through GWAS study are in people of European ancestry. And you can see that uh, on the right here, three quarter is that uh, pink, uh, pink circle there. So this is, and what that means, means that perhaps we will realize the, 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 the precision medicine promise, but, but more chances to, to get it right if you're uh, white and European. Um, there's been increase in the, in the diversity, but this, these numbers are still appalling, and those the GWAS diversity monitor uh, tracks in almost real time. So those are recent numbers. And the impact that this has in uh, population today, I, I, I picked that example. There's a plethora of examples out there. We know that oximeters don't work on dark skin and things like that. This example was really about um, a paper where Obermeyer et al. found that an algorithm that's being used in North America to decide the degree of care people should get is much less likely to recommend complex care for individuals in the black population. 
and they say, you know, if you're black or white, at the same degree of risk factor, with the same need for care, you're much less likely to actually get the care you need based on this algorithm decision if you have black skin. And a very interesting uh, element here, and why I wanted to mention this example, is they want to look into why. They say, okay, there is a problem. Why is there that problem? And they found out that the, the algorithm was using the amount of money that's being spent on care as a proxy for the amount of care that people need. The assumption being, if I need to spend $1,000 on you, you're probably sicker than somebody I need to spend $200 on. But then, you know, we spend less money on black people. So we spend less money on black people. The proxy is wrong. He's going to say we need to spend less money. And again, we're entering that loop where the data we generate uh, impacts the data we are getting and impacts uh, population and life. So, you know, we need to be really careful about what we are doing and how we are doing it uh, to, to kind of break that circle uh, of data. And there's been many efforts on, uh, you know, addressing diversity and trying to find uh, ways of better representing the world. Uh, an effort I was uh, involved with is the International Health Cohort Consortium, or IHCC, which uh, is, again, an open source coalition of uh, cohort owners, so people who recruit large cohorts of participants worldwide. And you can see here, there's just under 90 cohorts across 40 countries and 30 million participants that are currently part of the IHCC. Um, and they've really tried to have a broad uh, spectrum of uh, cohort worldwide. In particular, Asia has a lot of national genomics programs that were started in recent years. So this is a practical way we can try and encompass more diverse data uh, in our sets. Um, another global challenge I want to, to touch on uh, here is uh, pandemics. We're all out of the COVID pandemics. I'm not going to talk about the COVID pandemics. Uh, but before COVID, there was epidemics around uh, H1N1, 2009, swine flu, or right now we are very concerned around H5N1, the, the avian flu. And, uh, you know, we, we know that there's probably going to be more pandemics. We know that uh, we interact more with animals that uh, harbor disease. We know that our interaction and degradation of the environment, travel and so on, we anticipate there's going to be more pandemics. And this is going to be uh, to become an even bigger challenge that it's already been. And what do we do when we anticipate pandemics? We set up surveillance and monitoring networks so that we can identify, track, uh, isolate, cure uh, pandemics. The, the first network I was involved with was uh, the PISA network, the PHAC CHR Influenza Research Network, which became a Canadian immunization network. So I was doing a vaccine adverse event representation. And I was able to show that using structural knowledge, ontology, semantic representation, we could actually pass much faster uh, those human uh, reports on public health and identify uh, issues with vaccine administration, for example. Uh, in 2020, with uh, colleagues in uh, Cancogene, the, the Canadian COVID-19 genomics network was set up to monitor both uh, host and uh, viral genomics. And uh, more recently with Covarnet, the Coronavirus Variant Rapid Response Network, we are looking into setting up a wastewater monitoring so that we don't actually need to look at each individual, we can look at communities uh, as a whole. And the last, the last global challenge I think we need to, to think of as, as a community is around clinical data. You know, we, we want to make a difference in people's health. We want to impact humankind and do better to, to treat, identify people who are sick. And to do that, there's a huge amount of data, a huge amount of very diverse and heterogeneous data we need to pull together. Um, we need to look into patient demographics and vital signs, their lab results, progress notes. If they were uh, admitted into hospital, you want to know about the admission, discharge, transfers between service, uh, did they get uh, nursing at home? Uh, is there social determinants of health? Are they living in polluted areas? Are they coming from a more uh, unfavorable socioeconomic status? So all those things, procedure and billing codes, all those things we, we're going to need to bring together. And because it is human data, of course we want to keep you know, confidentiality and privacy forefront of our minds. And that raises an additional level of challenge on top of the heterogeneous data, which is how do we actually share 
that uh, individual level information across international uh, countries and regulation and how can we streamline access of data for research. There's been some efforts around you know, setting up standards for, for that type of uh, research. So for example, the, the five safe is the equivalent of the FAIR principle, which is really around the data need to be safe. So you know, if you don't need PHI, public health, inf private health information, keep your data there identified. Um, you want the data to be handled in safe projects by safe people. So when you want to access the data, we will want to check that you know, you're a proper researcher and you're doing proper research has no ethical concerns. You need ethical approval from ethics board, for example. Uh, safe settings, a lot of the research today happens in trusted research environments. So the data doesn't actually exit their, their infrastructure. You have to work behind those firewall such that the, the infrastructure is secure. And the safe output is you, you cannot download the data. You will have to uh, generate your analysis, generate your result, and that will need to be reviewed before you can actually export any sort of of data. And this, this set of challenges and issue end up generating huge amount of very, very heterogeneous data. How do we, you know, as a researcher, how do we make sense of it? How can I use those amount of data, bring them together and support research and support the work that, you know, researchers and biologists are, are doing? And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the work we've done uh, at OICR in the lab. Um, so, you know, fair data, I don't think I need to go very much over in this crowd, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So having, you know, good data management principles so that at least we, we know what we're talking about is great. Principles are great, standards, fantastic. But, you know, the fair paper is a PDF. How do I do fair in real life? And I'm going to argue that it's a little bit when you're, you go to IKEA and you're trying to build your... Uh, you know, you, your Billy bookcase and you have that collection of flat boxes, you need the right tools. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to, to get there. So you need the instruction, the principles such as fair, but you also need tools that will allow you to do it practically. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time telling you about the, the data portal tools that we are building that enables us to do a fair at scale. Uh, so a couple of years back, the, the team was charged with building the ICGC, the International Cancer Genome a consortium data portal. So CGC 25K uh, was collecting data about 25,000 individuals with cancer worldwide. And they've built a wonderful portal that you know, allows to browse, integrate, discover, search the data with visualization, faceted menu on the left, uh, really, really successful. And it was so successful that the, the NCI said, hey, we need a genomics data commons portal. So the team said, okay, we're, we're going to build a, the GDC portal. So we've built the portal and it kind of looks the same. You have the data in the middle, visualization at the top, faceted money on the, on the left. And then the, the realization came and said, well, we keep doing the same thing over and over again. We, we don't want to waste time doing that. Why don't we make an open source suite of software that will allow us, not only us, but also the community to do that better and at scale. And this is how uh, the Overture suite uh, was, was born. An overture is really a, a suite of little modular open source individual components. So think, think little Lego blocks that you can take and plug and play. Each of them has their very own specific well-defined scope and you assemble them to build those system reliably and very quickly. And Michel is right there at the front. He, he will tell you much more about overture uh, in his talk later this afternoon. And you know, Going back full circle, that means we can just set the system out, from, of the, out of the box and just reuse the software. You don't have to be concerned about issues and challenges and how am I going to authenticate my users? It does it for you. And if there's issues, there's a community of users that are available uh, to provide support and help. And the, the, sorry. and the overture ecosystem is really that suite of uh, independent reusable component that allows you to go from the data that you're generating on one hand side to the data analysis and the, the insight on the data uh, on the, at the other end of the pipeline. And as I said, it does, you know, every component does their own little uh, bit of functionality, so for authentication, file transfer, the validation, you need to index your data and then you need to present it. So each of the components can be reused uh, as you need it. So we have, we have a toolbox 
we have the overture toolbox we can use across different projects. How are we going to use that to address some of those challenges I was describing earlier? Um, so overture is really good. It's just not enough quite yet. The reason it's not enough is because when you want to look into data, you want to find harmonized data. Harmonized data means data you understand, means data that complies with a model. And this is, a, you know, machine learning detects longest cow in the world. So this is a picture of a cow, supposedly two halves of a cow split by a pillar. Now, as a human, you know that a cow is not 5.2 meters. A machine doesn't know, doesn't care. But as a human, you can build a model that will say, you know, a cow is an animal that has a certain number of legs and has a specified maximum length and stuff like that. And if you are able to build those models, those standards, and apply those into your computer system, then you stop making mistakes like that. And you can better represent the world and have accurate, validated data. Um, so this is the type of work we've done for IHCC on large-scale cohorts. We've built a little model to represent a cohort information. Uh, so Gecko is the genomics uh, cohort knowledge ontology, represents uh, shared consensus attributes of things like demographics or the type of lab results, the type of sequencing that was done, was there imaging, the type of disease the participant had. So very high level, small vocabulary, but has allowed us to pull together those large cohort uh, information worldwide to build the IHCC cohort at last browser. And that means as a researcher, you can go to the, the browser and you can search for information of interest and identify information of interest to your research. Uh, we've done this work with uh, Philippe Awadala at OICR and Thomas Keane uh, in the UK. Um, we've written a grant, which I think is getting reviewed as we speak. So if you're reviewing an IH grant, please, we, we, we want to develop this further. Um, <laughs> The, this is great for discovery. It doesn't do much more than that yet. So you can find the data, but if you want to actually access and use the data, we are not quite there yet with this platform. So we need to do uh, more work there. Um, some of the work I'm doing, uh, Herbie mentioned with GA4GH, uh, Moni and myself are co-lead of the uh, clinical and phenotypic representation work stream. Uh, we've worked with other colleague, uh, Ian Foray is at NIH, Francis Renson at the Ontario Brain Institute, and Orion Busk and uh, Grant Hood. We've worked on representing a phenotypic information in structured way through little phenopackets. As the name indicates, it's a little packet of phenotypic information. It just has a specific structure, uses specific ontologies such as HPO. Um, Orion and Grant have been working on a family and relationship representation. And what we really like to do is bring those two together and be able to build aggregated, computationally amenable uh, population level cohorts, such as I don't need to know the detail of the individual representation, but I'd like to know, you know, what's the proportion of people in that cohort that have cancer? What's the proportion of people that are pediatric patients? Uh, and so on. And so again, carrying my little toolbox, my little GA for GH toolbox on the side here, we can use pheno packets, but we can also use other standards that natively leverage pheno packets, such as Beacon to do discovery. And again, the, the power of open source and having a community of builder and developer and user, I don't have to build Beacon. If I export my data in pheno packets, I get Beacon for free. Yay. I like doing free work. <laughs> Um, you know, so thinking about the other challenge on pandemics, um, pandemics are fast occurring events. COVID happened, shut down the world. Swine flu happened, let's be careful about uh, meat coming in. So we need to have those open source tools to enable us to do rapid response and monitoring real time in communities. Um, Justin uh, is here, we'll tell you a little bit more about our work with uh, COVID-19 in Canada. The, the high cliff note is that we using a little toolbox, a little overture suite, we were able to set up a COVID monitoring portal across Canada for COVID viral sequences in less than a month. It did need refining and more work, and Justin will tell you all the detail of what was not working quite right, but the portal was up and running very quickly and was really available to address the challenges we needed to. So again, modular tools that we can reuse open access that are extensible 
and feed back into the, the source code. Um, something I'm particularly proud with uh, VirusSeq and again, power of open source, uh, we've worked with the, the PHAGE network, so the Public uh, Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, which is led by uh, Alan Christoffels in uh, South Africa. And Alan said, you know, virus is fantastic, but I have much more than COVID and I would like to track pathogens across Africa. Uh, can I reuse virus? I'm like, yeah, of course you can, go ahead. And we worked with Alan and we've helped him set up the, the African pathogen data sharing and archive pl platform. We had you know, challenges and issues with things interesting. The infrastructure uh, can be very challenging uh, in South Africa, but we made it work and the portal's up and, and running. And I, I, I'm really proud of that one. Um, but yeah, so we can find the data. We have ideas on how we're going to discover the data and collect the data of interest. We discussed the fact that this is controlled access human data. How do I actually get access to the data? So the clinical data, the access of the data, this is just an example from uh, dbGaP, the, the database of genome uh, phenome, uh, phenotypes in the US. And accessing dbGaP data can be um, challenging. Mm -hmm. okay. So it's, it's not necessarily a difficult process. It's a well-established process, but it is a long and protracted process. I'm not going to walk you through the whole the whole pipeline, the, the diagram is on their website, but you know you need to write your research proposal, you need to get ethics board approval, your institution official need to sign, you need to create accounts in different systems, you need to do a, a data access request, which is a, a, a plain text form. This gets reviewed by a collection of humans. They may or may not agree that your representation is uh, comprehensive enough, so it can go back to you. It takes a couple of weeks to a couple of months, best, best of cases. So, not impossible to do, but in terms of, you know, fast and easy access, not quite there yet. And to be fair, it's not just a problem with dbGaP. All of the large genomic resources worldwide will have the same issue. dbGaP had a nice diagram I could reuse. Um, the, the way we've tackled that specific issue was, again, in the context of the GA4GH, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. I worked with uh, Moran Kabili and uh, Jonathan Lawson at the Broad, and we've said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if there was a little vocabulary we could use to consistently represent uh, the, da the data use condition on the data sets? So we've built a data use ontology, which has terms like um, this data set is consented for general research use, or this data set is usable only by not-for-profit institution, or this data set is usable for cancer research. And having the ability to codify the data use condition on data sets, allow us to tag the data sets in each of the repository. So to be fair to dbGaP, this is a screenshot from EGA, the European Genome Phenome Archive, so the equivalent of dbGaP in Europe. And you can use those little tags to search for data you can actually use. So if you're a pharma company, you will not have access to not-for-profit data. If you're doing cancer research, you will not have access to diabetes data, and so on and so on. So you can find the data of interest that at least you have a chance to be approved for. You don't need to make a data access request and be told, sorry, it doesn't match after three months. Um, so this worked out quite well. So we've tagged a bunch of repository using the data use ontology. So the, the blue box here shows you a data repository, collection of data sets. Each of them has a little tag attached. And as a researcher coming in from the other side, you can say, I want to do cancer research. And you can have humans or an algorithm in the middle triaging the data set and the permissions uh, for you. And this was actually very, very successful. It's been implemented uh, worldwide, over 200,000 data sets. Uh, we're really hoping to take that further and build the infrastructure to leverage that uh, worldwide. Uh, so right now we have data set, you know, all of us, uh, Seneca, uh, EGA in the UK, I was just showing you the screenshot, H3 Africa in, in Africa, uh, Gem Japan, so Australian genomics, so, you know, already using the same standard worldwide and working together in improving the standard, there's always stuff to add and change, and making it uh, amenable to a different set of tools. And that leads me to uh, the other project that uh, we're working on uh, in, uh, in my lab, which is a, a large international um, project called Argo. 
Uh, so ICGC Argo is the successor of ICGC 25K. So it's leveraging the experience we had collecting 25,000 uh, molecular data sets for individual patients worldwide and adding clinical metadata on each of the data points. Uh, so this is a project we're working on with uh, Lincolnstein at OICR, and we have uh, just over 63,000 patients committed, and it's a global project here, so 15 countries and 26 projects have said, we are on board, we will send you our data. Um, and this has worked out really well, and we've been able, again, take my little toolbox of open source tool, we use the data use ontology, GA4G passport, which is another standard for authentication and authorization, and apply that to build a, an automated data access request module, such that as a researcher, you can do everything into that one dashboard, collect your signature, emails get sent, things get signed. It's all automated as a dashboard to follow and track the status. And you can see that my little overture uh, toolkit here is a little bit grayed out. We have not quite uh, incorporated this in the suite yet. It's coming uh, very soon. The, the, the ICGC Algo project uh, suffers from all those data access and regulatory challenges I was talking about earlier. It's an international project. You probably know things like GDPR came up in Europe. Every country starts having very much privacy uh, preserving legislation that prevents any of the individual level genomic data to get out. Uh, so for Argo, we're working on data federation. So we are uh, doing this. So John in my team is working with David uh, Torrance at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center to set up a little Argo node uh, in Barcelona. And the idea is we keep the Canadian data, they keep the European data, and we're interoperable. We're all reusing Overture. We're all using fellow packets and beacons following GA4GH standards. And we can talk to each other pretty much natively uh, once the platforms are set up. Um, there's still some work to do in terms of, you know, aggregated view and how can we aggregate the data while maintaining privacy, but this is uh, coming very soon. Um, another piece of work we're doing is on participant enrollment. I told you you can tag data sets with the duo code. Wouldn't it be nicer if the participant that provides consent initially could consent using a duo code? So we're doing a participant enrollment portal. This is an example of uh, OHRN, uh, the Ontario Hereditary Cancer Research Network, uh, with Raymond, Lauren, uh, Michelle is involved as well. Um, so we are, again, reusing the same toolbox across yet a different project to uh, leverage uh, information. So this is just really a, a quick tour of how you can reuse open source software in your research and you know, spend the time on the more interesting elements and I, I want to finish this talk with where are we going next? So we've talked about fair data, we've talked about AI, and I'm going to argue that for data to be AI ready, we need more than fair. We need what I'm calling true data. We need to be able to track the data. The data needs to be reasonable, understandable, and ethical as well. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes telling you what that means uh, to me and what I think it should mean to uh, all of you. So the, the data tracking is really you know, pretty much what it says in the name. It's about how do we know where our data comes from? How, how do we track provenance of the information? How do we know who generated the sequences? There's a couple of vocabularies that are already out there, so uh, prov, echo, the evidence uh, code ontology, credit for authors. You may have used that in your publication. Um, I think the challenge is all of those tend to be generated after the data. So, you know, you generate your data, you want to publish, you can say, okay, what's each author's contribution? It's not natively embedded in each of the data sets. Typically, you don't know who generated the, the sequence uh, in the, that you're looking at unless there's an extra metadata file. And I think we need to do a little bit better because to encourage open data sharing, people want to be getting attribution and credit for their work. So I think we need to embed the tracking information more natively in the data. The, the reasoning aspect, we need to be able to reason over the data. The data is spread across different data sets. This is an example of different ontologies representing uh, different terms. So you have disease, symptom, genes. How do we link across? How do we formally, logically represent those links such that we can use reasoner and inference to validate, generate new insight, and so on? Uh, we've tried, and other people have tried with some resources, there's a lot of inconsistencies 
once you try to do that at scale, for example. How do we understand data? So, you know, this crowd is about open source software. There's a lot of open source AI, which is great. We've been able to install some of it locally at OICR and run it on a, a private health data. But there's a lot of cloud source models, which are actually really working really, really well. And you get commercial support and you get innovation and they have money and they keep progressing. So how do we balance the, the open source model, which is great, with the, the power of the money, I guess? Um, so, you know, those types of things are really important when you're looking at uh, privacy and data and understanding what your model does. And the last, the last thing is around ethical and equitable data. And uh, Alexi is Alexi is over there. She has a, pro, uh, a poster on the Pan Canadian Genome Library uh, project. Uh, Guillaume Bourque is leading. Was talking a little bit about. And one thing we've done there is we've natively embedded EDI consideration in the models. Uh, there's some models like uh, GraphRag that promise to be uh, privacy preserving. We haven't tried those yet. And we are looking into tiny models. Can we use models that are less resource hungry and computing hungry so that we can use them in more uh, diverse settings? And going back into the, the, the understanding the data, and this is uh, going towards the end of this talk, it's, you know, it's really important that there's going to be a keynote tomorrow on uh, understanding and explaining AI data. We really need to know what's happening in those black box. So th this cartoon says, you know, oh, this is your machine learning system. Yep. You pour the data in, you put your algorithm in, and you collect the answers on the other side. And the question is, well, okay, what if the answers are wrong? <laughs> Not a problem. You just push it in again, stir the pile, and eventually it's going to look right. And we've all done that, right? We've all slightly changed parameters and stuff, and then it starts looking right. But unless we actually know what happens in the pile and how the things have been stirred, we are not going to know whether we can trust our results or not. So it's really important that we use open source model, or at least we understand what's happening uh, when the models are being run. Think again about the proxy for healthcare costs and the impact on population not getting the care they need. So we've just started uh, doing some of that work. Prafam and my team is looking at extracting uh, lab report information for OHCRN instead of doing that manually using uh, LLM-based data extraction such that we can structure and validate the data. And uh, Andres, my, my very first PhD student in the lab, works with uh, Benjamin Hepkins as well, and is trying to extract EHR data information. Um, so again, we're trying to get the text, extract the information, test a variety of models, and generate knowledge graph to uh, leverage insight. And I know Andrew will talk about knowledge graph tomorrow, so he will tell you much more about that than uh, me today. Um, Last part of this talk, ongoing opportunity. So I want to work with you. I just started my research lab. I want to find cool and exciting projects and cool people to work with and build open science and software. Um, some of the areas I'm interested in, knowledge representation, I really want to keep building you know, models that represent the world, core, summary, uh, representation. I also want to think about uh, infrastructure. So I've told you about Overture. We're going to add the data access module you know, we've done a little bit of NLP-based data harmonization. Can we do that better at scale uh, without it being so specific? In terms of validation and enrichment, can we do better for curation? Can we do a graph-based validation, recommend our engines, you know, based on the data we have? Can we suggest better annotation, standard, literature, and use elements for curation because curation is really hard and expensive? And last, the exchange uh, and the structural representation of the data. We've talked a tiny bit about fellow packets. I also want to think about uh, EHR and text mining on EHR data, encoding that into fellow packets, exchanging the data across resources, and building that interoperability uh, layer. All right, bringing it home. So what I've talked to you about today, uh, the first thing was, you know, career is not linear. You're know, going to move places, countries, institutions, projects. This is great. More opportunities, more ideas, more people. Uh, global challenges are going to need global solutions, and we need to come together as a community to address those. If you want to make sense of the data, and you must make sense of the data, you really need to understand what's happening with your data. Your data needs to be true and AI ready. If you're building open source, it's great. You can carry your little toolbox around across your project and reuse and leverage, really leverage your 
the resources you have on the things that are still missing and the gaps. And finally, there's much more to do, and I'm really looking forward to what the future is going to bring. Last, data's great. I still love data. 20 years later, I'm still in love with data. That's not going to change. But you know, data is really just a stepping stone. Data is a stepping stone for other people to generate insight based on uh, the data that's been generated. And I really like this quote from uh, Sir Paul Nurse, which says, you know, it would re really have been a pity if Darwin had just collecting data about uh, the beaks of the finch. It's, you know, it's about collecting the data, having the data, and driving the right inferences from the data. And I, I, I think it's a very nice uh, illustration. And with that, I want to say uh, thank you to, to our funder, all the projects, the teams I've had the chance, the privilege to work with. Uh, and I try to put together a, a, a collage of uh, people that, you know, across time and across those projects have really made a difference in, in who I am, and in particular, the, the three amazing scientists at the top here, Fiona Brinkman, Melissa Handel, and Helen Parkinson have been phenomenal mentors. If you, if you can ever work with either of them, go for it. Just sign in blood. Uh, ju <laughs> just go for it. You, you, you will not regret it. Um, and you know, there's a collection of people here. I'm not going to go through the names, but I'm really excited every day I get to work with some of them and it keeps life so interesting. And I want to work with all of you. So your picture next up there. Thank you. Hi, Melanie. Great talk, uh, as usual. Um, so we've heard a couple of times at this conference about the care principles, too, yep. um, about giving people authority of their own data and giving back to the community and things like that. And I saw a really good presentation yesterday about the Silent Genomes Project for Indigenous um, indigenous variants. Yep. How do you in integrate that with the need for getting um, data from these underrepresented populations, not just in Canada, but across the world? There's been a historical um, misuse of people's uh, mm -hmm. consent, I would say. And so how do you balance that against the need for more data? Thank you. That's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so you're right. There's the, the care principle, there's the, the OCAP certification. We have somebody in the team just got trained on uh, the principle of uh, sovereignty. And I feel a little bit remiss because I forgot to mention that in the talk. The, the Pan-Canadian Genome Library, we are actually working with Simon Genomes and uh, Wyatt uh, Wasserman into better representing uh, the data that they're collecting. We just had a project meeting before ISMB actually with uh, Guillaume here in Montreal and David's over there. Uh, and we were thinking, you know, I don't think we're quite ready to integrate their data natively because as you say, they have very different ways of um, say, monitoring the data and the usage of the data, but we want to start building interoperability across the representation. So we are going to look into using the same models uh, across the different data sets. Another interesting thing that um, Australian genomics, you mentioned consent. Uh, as I was showing, the, the data use ontology has been used by Australian genomics. So they have a large Aboriginal population. And uh, my colleague Tiffany Boathood uh, works with Catherine North over there, and they've built a little app that they can take on their iPad to collect consent of remote population. Uh, they've also translated you in a bit more lay language and friendly language to accommodate you know, people who don't necessarily understand legalese and things like that. So there's, there's a couple of things happening. I don't think we're quite there yet, but I think there's a willingness to, to make things change. Yes? Hi, I really, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if, um, I was wondering if you, if you thought about like, in like in collecting a big data set, like, um, how how to estimate like systematic uncertainties in the in the data that you collect from lots of different sources and like like batch correction and things like that but then also like so, some way to estimate what kind of error is left over after you do the correction i'm going to say yes and no <laughs> um so at this point in time we've looked mostly into the metadata so you know we haven't done 
it's, it's you really. Can't do it. You can't even think about it without if you don't have the metadata, and I, I noticed that as you were talking. So we're we're doing we're looking into the the metadata and uh, sorry, but your question was around batch corrections and you were asking something else. Generally, it's just synodic uncertainties, but batch corrections would be one of those. Yeah, so we're we're only looking at the metadata, bringing it together and harmonizing it. Uh, I think the way of looking at batch correction uncertainty is the tracking of the data provenance. So, for example, the the mappings, you know, we have to do a lot of mappings because people like doing things their own way. I don't think we have a way to consistently um, say, record the original value, the derived value, how the inference was made. Some efforts exist, for example, for the gene ontology, we were using uh, the evidence code ontology to say, you know, this is manually curated, validated, or this is electronically inferred, and you may want to take this with a, a pinch of salt. I don't think there's a good way to do it. If you have ideas, I would love to, to hear from you. I'm interested in that kind of thing, so I would love to, I would love to talk about it more. Let's, do, let's make it happen. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yes. All right. Th thank you for a great talk, Melanie. Thanks. So, so two questions. Uh, first, when you, uh, since you, you deal a lot with ontologies, and um, uh, ontologies are basically, you know, by name, capture what we know. And if it's not there, we can't do anything with that. Have you analyzed, uh, you know, clinical intelligence and so for for uh, biases um, or things that are not there or things that are overrepresented or underrepresented in, in ontologies? And my second question is: You gave the example of, you know, um, I don't know, Maori Nazis or, or, or some, you know, inappropriate things like that because of forced diversity in the Google AI type of things. And um, ha have you seen things like, for example? Um, wrong diagnoses, for example, like, uh, or, or uh, wrong AI diagnosis as a result of that, uh, for example, um, or misdiag or, or underdiagnoses. So uh, say breast cancer in men is, is underdiagnosed because nobody thinks of that. Or as opposed to, for example, ovarian cancer in men, which is of course impossible, but it may be diagnosed by an AI. So have you, I'm, I'm, I'm putting edge cases here that are yeah. probably, but, but have you seen things like that? And how, how would we repair that without, uh, by providing the correct representation, but not in a way that will generate these, these, these obviously false paradoxes? So the, the short answer is no. So the, you know, I started my research, <laughs> so my, my poor PhD student six months in. Uh, so he's, he's looking into those type of issues uh, with, uh, I mentioned Benjamin. Um, we know that there's issues, like uh, I talked a little bit about uh, oximeter that tends to uh, over-evaluate the oxygen oxygenation rate in uh, people with darker skin because it goes through uh, the skin. So we know that there's issues. Uh, we have not looked at it uh, yet. I think it's definitely something we need to look into. I don't know how we correct it. I know um, Google looked into, you know, forcing the diversity and that didn't quite work out. So we're adding extra prompts natively in the image generation when it's about generating persons. Uh, one of the things that Andres is looking into is keeping a human in the loop and fine-tuning uh, the algorithms that we are using for data extraction. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to work out. Um, I think we, we, you know, we need to we need to validate anything that we are doing, and the the best validation we know of. So, for example, for OHRN, we are using a human to uh, say this is right, this is wrong. You've missed 800 genes there. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Hi, Richard. Melanie. Thanks for the inspirational talk. And it's been terrific to work with you over the 20 year career. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is this, this data use ontology, I think could be very powerful. Do you envision a time where our consent forms will allow participants to check boxes about how they want their data to be able to be used instead of doing it at a study wide level? Could it be done at a participant level? Yes, this is exactly what I want to do. So Australian Genomics started doing that with their little, uh, it's called the CTRL app. So you know, as a participant, you say, I consent to A, B, and C, and I don't want to do that. Uh, we are doing that with old Sharon in the participant enrollment portal. We are going to build that in uh, with Guillaume on the Pan-Canadian Genome Library. Um, instead of having, you know, the human saying, okay, first 5,000 5, individuals are going to be collected in the same data sets. And sometimes you have to, made the choice of being more restrictive. Uh, so yeah, sure. the, the participant level, 
Uh, there was some work done uh, with GA4GH on the machine readable constant forms mm -hmm. uh, because they're all textual and paper based and different. And I'm right. sure yours are different right. than ours. And you know it different. is, right? Yes. So, yeah, we're trying to standardize the the content of the consent form and the content of the data access request as well. Yeah, awesome. Thanks a lot, Melanie. Merci, Avec. One, uh, one question, uh, you were referring to the uh, Overture uh, collection of Lego bricks yeah. as uh, software services. Is there... Uh, is there any consideration in in this approach for software development that uh, is related to their uh, maintenance over time, fundability, okay. sustainability, and so on? Asking the hard questions. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Um, Sorry. No, but so I don't know if you've attended uh, Fiona's keynote talk on the on mm -hmm. the very first day, but she was touching on the issue of fundability and sustainability. So the way it's worked out for us was uh, reusing the software, building that little software plus one she was mentioning where, you know, you need to make a new argument that you're adding functionality, so you need to get uh, more resources. Uh, right now, we are very uh, thankful to NIH. We have a, a, an overture grant that supports us until 2026 from ITCR. And so that's really allowed us to really focus on the, the software itself. Um, the way we've maintain added functionalities for additional funding coming in from projects. So if you want, you have the software stack, the functionality that are supported by NIH, and then for different projects, we're going to add different functionalities. So Justin will talk about VirusSeq. Uh, VirusSeq is uh, over half a million little viral sequences. Didn't match what we were doing with huge cancer genomic uh, information. We had to rethink the whole indexing uh, for example, but no, it's much better. It, it, you can actually use on something else other than a tumor normal pair of files, for example. Um, so, you know, having those different projects allow us to build uh, features in the suites. And I think that's really the, the nice part with uh, open source as well is that it goes back um, into the, the code base and you can reuse it. So if you wanted to do uh, viral genomics like uh, Alan in, in Africa, then you can do that. You can reuse the suite. It's probably going to work out for you. And uh, Michelle has spent a lot of time, you will talk about it, uh, helping um, outreach and engagement of users. You'll talk about that, right? No pressure. All right.